Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Shuley School of Law. My name is Camille Cameron. I'm the Dean and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all here. Uh, this morning I welcomed the conference attendees, but now the group has expanded. And so it's a pleasure again to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Um, and again, I will begin by acknowledging my welcome to you this afternoon that we are here today for this lecture gathering on traditional Mi'kmaq territory. This is the 27th annual Ted Wickwire Memorial Lecture. The law school is delighted that we've been able to partner with the Nova Scotia Barrister Society to host this for the, these many years, and we look forward to continuing that partnership. Uh, this year, as you know, the title is Ethics and Professionalism in the Practice of Aboriginal Law. It's especially timely now, as law schools and the profession, among others, are responding to the TRC calls to action, in particular, calls to action 27 and 28. Um, and here I'm going to put in a plug for the law school. We're very proud of the efforts we've been making to respond to the calls to action. Um, kudos in particular to Professors Metallic and Devlin and to our TRC working group who really have worked hard to ensure that we implement effective and meaningful ways of responding to the TRC calls to action. Before I turn things over to Julia Cornish, president of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, and to tell you a little bit about Ted Wickwire, and to my colleague, Professor Devlin, who will introduce the, uh, the panelists and the, the topic for today, um, I just want to acknowledge a few people. As you all know, any of you who've ever organized anything before know that you need help to make it happen. And so I want to mention a few people. Uh, first, my, colleagues, Professor, my colleague, Professor Richard Devlin, for all of the work he's done to bring the conference uh, and the lecture to fruition. Now, Richard's going to come up and speak after me. Because I haven't been directly involved in the organizing, I'm sure there are people who've been involved that I won't know about. So he's going to say thank you to them as well. I do want to mention Michelle Kirkwood as well. You've seen her here all day, and we couldn't uh, make this possible without her. Of course, I want to thank all of you, those who've come to the lecture, and those of you who've uh, been attending and who are attending the conference, for your commitment to talking in a collaborative and uh, productive way and a creative way about a topic as important as legal ethics and professionalism. As I say, I'm sure there are others, and I'll leave it to Professor Devlin to say thank you to them. Uh, so again, welcome everyone. I'm delighted that you're here. I'm sure it's going to be an excellent presentation. And I'm now going to call on Julia Cornish to tell us a little bit about the person for whom the lecture is named. Thank you, Dean Cameron. On behalf of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, it's my pleasure to bring greetings and to spend a few minutes talking about the late Ted Wickwire the namesake for today's lecture. The legal profession, as indeed other professions, is under public scrutiny as never before. That is perhaps as it should be. We have, after all, a public trust of considerable magnitude. In furtherance of our obligations under this trust, we should have a more direct hand in the formulation of ethics and behavioral standards which are to prevail here. Anything less is an abdication of our responsibility. I wish I'd written those words, but I didn't. <laughs> Ted Wickwire wrote those words in 1990, but I think you would agree they are as true today as they were then. Mr. Wickwire was president of the society at the time of his death in 1991. His connection to this university was strong. He served 13 years on the Board of Governors after graduating with a Bachelor of Commerce in 1959 and an LLB in 1962. He accomplished this while quarterbacking the Dalhousie Tigers, I understand with some distinction, and playing varsity basketball as well. In 1991, he was posthumously awarded the Weldon Award for, public, for Unselfish Public Service, due no doubt not only for his work as society president, but also as the first chairman of the Nova Scotia Legal Aid Commission and as chairman of the society's, Bar Society's Legal Ethics Committee. Ted Wickwire's involvement with legal, legal ethics went beyond his service on this committee. Under his leadership, the committee produced Nova Scotia's first legal ethics handbook, and my quotation was from the foreword to that volume. When Mr. Wickwire died at the premature age of 52, the Halifax Herald <coughs> praised him for championing two great legal causes, 
universal access to legal services, and professional standards for lawyers. <coughs> Much has changed in the profession since 1991, and as the society struggles to evolve the profession and focus on becoming proactive, proportionate, and principled, there are certain things which remain the same. As Ted Wickwire concluded at the end of his forward to the Legal Ethics Handbook, these changes must not come at the expense of our ethics and standards. In that spirit, I welcome everyone to today's panel. Thank you. So as the Dean mentioned, um, this particular presentation today, this panel comes at a, a very significant moment in, in Canada. There are three things I want to say briefly to set the context for this panel. The first is that this panel was inspired in part as a response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls for actions 26 and 27. And I know many of us are familiar with them, but there are some points that are, are worth briefly highlighting. One is that there's a call to the Federation of Law Societies of Canada, and there are many members of the Federation here today. So it's an attempt to sort of collaborate with the Federation to ensure that lawyers receive appropriate cultural competency training. But one of the things they particularly emphasize is Aboriginal crime relations. And so this talk today, this panel today, is very much an inquiry and reflection, in, a reflection on the importance of thinking through Aboriginal crime relations. The call to action also in 28 focuses on the law schools, including our own law school. And once again, it requires us to develop a course on Aboriginal law, Abor sorry, Aboriginal people in the law, uh, which we are working on at the law school here, and certainly at least in the first year, and certainly for St. Metallic has been foundational to us achieving that. But once again, it also calls upon us as law schools to focus on Aboriginal crime relations. So that's the first sort of framing moment here. The second framing moment is this talk also relates to the recent controversy in Ontario in its required statement of principles. In a 2016 report, report called Challenges Faced by Racialized Licensees, a working group of the Law Society of Upper Canada, which is actually not called the Law Society of Upper Canada anymore, it's just called the Law Society of Somewhere, right? <laughs> they haven't worked out where they are yet, right? They came out with 13 recommendations, and those recommendations were approved um, by convocation in December this year. However, one of these particular recommendations, it's actually recommendation 13, sorry, recommendation 3.1 says, that each licensee in Ontario will be required to quote unquote, adopt and abide by a statement of principles acknowledging their obligation to promote equality, diversity and inclusion generally, and their behavior towards colleagues, employees, clients and the public. So clearly members of the Aboriginal community in Canada, or at least in Ontario, are clearly influenced or impacted by this requirement. What's blown up in the last week or two, or a couple of weeks, is that there are some legal academics in Ontario and some licensees in Ontario who protest that this particular requirement is an infringement of the freedom of expression and conscience, and therefore are now seeking for an exception for quote unquote, conscientious objectors. So again, this, this is a, an important issue as it has an impact on Aboriginal and Indigenous communities in Canada. Thirdly, and closer to home, here at Dalhousie, in the last week or so, there has been a significant controversy around Ms. Mizuma Khan. And Ms. Mc, Ms. Khan, who is non-Indigenous, led the move by the Dalhousie Student Union this summer to boycott Canada's 150, 150th celebrations on the basis of 400 years of oppression and genocide against Aboriginal peoples is not something to be celebrated. She's attacked for taking this leadership position and escorted by a significant number of people. In response, on her personal, web, uh, on, sorry, on her personal Facebook page, she, po she posted a hard-hitting critique of what she described as white fragility. This led to a complaint by at least one white student that she'd, she'd breached the student code of conduct. This then led the university to institute discipline proceedings against her, which uh, they just dropped earlier this week. Now, while obviously Ms. Khan is not a lawyer or a law student, or at least not yet, right, her experience does raise profound questions 
about how do we all behave ethically and responsibly in the context of complex Aboriginal Indigenous relationships in Canada. So to take those three sort of context setting dynamics, we've brought together a panel of four people who have worked, and thought, have worked on and thought about these issues very carefully. We have three panelists and one commentator. So our first panelist is Jeff Bickert, QC. Right? He's the Assistant Deputy Attorney General Litigation Branch. This basically means that he oversees all civil litigation involving the federal government and manages the department's six regional offices. Now, Jeff sort of got to that elevated position after having spent 16 years working in the Northwest Territories, first as a prosecutor traveling with the courts to over 60 communities in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, and then as Deputy Minister of Justice for the Northwest Territories from 1987 to 1994. More recently, he has worked on community justice issues involving Indigenous communities across Canada under Canada's Aboriginal Justice Strategy. He's also worked with Fisheries and Oceans as our senior legal advisor, where Aboriginal fisheries issues were an important part of the work. And we know how important that is in Nova Scotia in particular. Our second presenter is Geoffrey Hewitt. Geoffrey is a professor at the University uh, of Windsor in the Faculty of Law. Geoffrey is from a Cree background, and his research, research interests include Indigenous legal orders and governance, constitutional administrative law, human rights and remedies, business law, and art and law. So clearly at the University of Windsor, they teach many more courses than faculty members do here at Dalhousie. <laughs> so we're happy to be at Dal. Don't let the Dean know that. <laughs> Jeff is also the past president of the, of the Indigenous Bar Association of Canada, and since 2002 served as the general counsel to the Rama First Nation. He also in 2011 received the Canadian General Counsel Award for Social Responsibility. Our third presenter, panelist, is Professor Naomi Metallic, who everyone in this room knows. I'll say very little about her, except that she is, of course, the Chancellor's Chair in Aboriginal Law and Policy. She is a Dalhousie Law School grad, she looks School of Law grad. Um, she also clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada with Justice Michel Bastrash, who's certainly very well known in the legal ethics community for a variety <laughs> of reasons. Right? <laughs> and as a legal scholar, She's most interested in writing about how the law can be harnessed to promote the well-being and self-determination of Indigenous peoples in Canada. There are three panellists, and then we're going to wrap up our panel discussion with some comments from Professor Pooja Parmar. And Professor Parmar is an assistant professor at the University of Victoria in, in BC. She has her law degree from the Punjab University in India, then she came to Canada and did her LLM and PhD at UBC. Her current research focuses are on the legal profession in Canada and, in, and India, issues of indig indigeneity, and human rights. She's currently working on four research projects, one of which is a study of lawyers who represent indigenous peoples in British Columbia. Her most recent book is called Indigeneity and Legal Pluralism in India, Claims, Histories, and Meanings, published by Cambridge University Press. So we have a great panel established for you. Each of the panelists will speak for about 20 minutes. If they don't, I will throw paper at them. And then Pooja will have seven minutes or so to wrap up. Then we'll have lots of time for questions. So thank you, everyone, and thank you to the panel. So does etiquette allow me to speak from here, or do you want me there? Wherever you're comfortable. Let's do here. Can people hear me? All right. So listen, uh, thank you very much for coming here tonight. I, I naively said to Richard last night that it's going to be great because it's 4 to 6.30 on a Friday night. Uh, it'll just be the panelists, and I'll get a chance to really talk to them about these things of great <laughs> importance because there'll be, uh, be nobody else here. And then he gave me the bad news that somehow this is mandatory for the law students. So, <laughs> uh, so that sort of threw that out. And then he told me just a few minutes ago that a reporter for the Globe and Mail is here, uh, to which I thought, well, I'm not really too worried at my stage of life about career limiting moves, so uh, I'll say what I have to say in any event. I wanted to start, if I could, with uh, just a reflection on the fact that um, I'm working now uh, with a government which has a very aggressive agenda, as we know, in terms of rebuilding a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples, Crown Indigenous relationships. So it may seem that my remarks are colored by the fact that, uh, of that particular government 
but I hope that my remarks would straddle this government, previous governments, future governments, in terms of my thinking on uh, how uh, government lawyers should, should act in relation to indigenous issues. So that's the frame in which I'd like to talk. And then I just want to start off with, I don't know what made me think of this, but a metaphor, or two metaphors, coming from a comatic. If you know, a comatic is a, a wooden sled, generally, uh, used to, among Inuit communities around the world. It's two rails and some, some wooden slats across the top. Um, once I was visiting in a, a remote uh, Arctic community where there was an RCMP detachment, and the sergeant there had come from a commercial crime division, and he was going through a great deal of cultural shock being in the high Arctic after this work in downtown Toronto. And he found that there was an elder who, well, there were actually there were a number of elders who would like to come to the police detachment in the middle of the afternoon and have tea. And he wasn't quite sure where the tradition came from because his predecessor had left before he arrived. But he thought it was a nice thing that the elders would come to town and, and, and see what he was doing in his action and comings and goings. And one of them, um, who did not speak English, and uh, the police sergeant didn't speak Inuktitut, uh, was in a wheelchair. And the particular community was not a great place for wheelchair accessibility, and the police detachment was, was no better. So he asked Ottawa if he could have um, wood to build a ramp for the wheelchair uh, for the elder to come in the afternoons. And they said, no, no, it's not any part of our standard, you know, accessibility in the Arctic, it's impossible, no, we can't afford to buy uh, a ramp wood. So he said, okay, I need six comatics. And they said, excuse me, what? Well, I need sleds behind the skidoo. You know, we go out on patrol, they get beaten up, and I need, from my experience, six of them. He says, well, we normally only pay for two. Well, I want six. So they sent him lumber for six comatics, and he built his ramp. <laughs> and then he had to ask for lumber for comatics later because he didn't have any comatics. Um, so it strikes me that all of us... We, we pull our comatics through our lives, and on that comatic can be an awful lot of biases and prejudices and stereotypes, built up ideas, acquired, accreted, somehow got there. And if we don't turn around from time to time and see what's on the comatic, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. It's either too heavy, it's carrying the wrong things, it's not providing things like nourishment, food to get us through our, our journeys. So it really is important for us, I think, to look back at that comatic from time to time and check out whether it's got the right things on it to carry us through the journey of life. I think that's so true in, in the Crown Indigenous relationship world. Um, we can't just rely on our judgment and acquired experience and our professionalism and all our education and all those things to get us there. Uh, unless we do some real soul searching with the help of many others around us, we won't get there. So, I mean, I've had the, the great privilege to work with uh, two Indigenous Ministers of Justice, one in the Northwest Territories, Stephen Kakwe, who is a lifelong friend, and more recently, Jody Wilson-Raybould from British Columbia. So, uh, uh, one, I guess, a Coast Salish, one uh, Satu Dene uh, person, and the, I learned a lot from them, and I continue to learn from my current minister. So, some reflections on what's the, what's the job of a, of a government lawyer in the Crown Indigenous relationship and in the era we're in now. Um, and I, I've been a prosecutor in the past and there was a panel earlier today talking about that and I thought that was uh, very uh, thought provoking as well. So um, maybe a little bit about being a government lawyer and I've been one for a long time. I've been in private practice. I've been outside the federal government. I'm in the federal government now and it's my job to try to help I guess about a thousand lawyers and paralegals, professionals, in to figure out how they should conduct themselves in litigation, uh, particularly involving uh, Indigenous issues. I think the first thing we all have to remember, and I would say to law students, is that unlike in private practice, the lawyer-client relationship is not entirely the same within government. We use kind of a metaphor of a lawyer-client relationship, but it's an undivided crown. So we're part of that same crown, and we have to divide it up for purposes of practicality and say, well, that client is my client, and I'm their lawyer. And we create a lawyer-client relationship uh, that in general involves talking directly to the client in front of you, uh, an official within a department. But uh, we have to remember as well that this metaphor doesn't hold so well because our, our client is not that person or that department or that unit within a department or that agency. 
it's the Crown as a whole, the government as a whole, and so uh, we sometimes have a bit of a challenge with our clients, quote unquote, when they say, we want you to do X, and we say, yeah, that may be good for you, but it's not so good for the Crown uh, in, a, in a collective sense. And on, on Indigenous issues, that's increasingly so, where they are so cross-cutting in importance. Um, one client may say, well, it really would serve my interests if you, uh, make an example, fight aggressively and hard to win this case because uh, we can't afford the consequences of a loss. But in terms of the Crown Indigenous relationship and where you're trying to get to, we have to sometimes persuade or sometimes say no uh, or access uh, other levels of authority to get to a different result. So uh, clients are, I guess, occasionally suspicious of who we are acting for because they want to be uh, the person who's giving instructions. They're generally paying the bills. Uh, and we sometimes have to say, well, we can't actually always take your instructions, certainly not from the person directly in front of us. The other thing is that we have to be very, uh, I guess, we have to work very hard on the relationship with our clients because unlike in private practice, if we don't like them, we can't fire them out of our office with their file. Uh, and if they don't like us, they can't go and get a legal agent uh, to, to do the work for them because, again, it's uh, only the Ministry of Justice can uh, hire agents. So we have to generally try very hard to build a, a trusting relationship with them. So those pose some challenges which are not insurmountable but require us to think very carefully about how we go about our business. Um, a new challenge I would say that does relate to this government more so than in previous governments is that uh, the Prime Minister has appointed our Minister, Jody Wilson-Raybould, in kind of two capacities. One is the Ministry of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. And secondly, in a broader policy capacity in relation to uh, some Indigenous issues, um, he, for instance, makes her the chair of a working group of ministers to review all laws and policies in fact affecting Indigenous peoples, all federal laws and policies. So she brings together ministers and they have a very ambitious and aggressive schedule to look through those things and prioritize and see what, which are the most uh, unfortunate or problematic and need to be reviewed in what order and, and make changes. And so they're, they're looking at some fundamental things. And they brought in some scholars and Indigenous uh, representatives uh, to help them with that. So I've talked about the, the, the captive relationship. The other thing I'd say is that the Attorney General is a very frequent litigant before the courts and on some pretty important public policy issues. It's true that we're also in court on fender benders and things like that from time to time, but generally speaking, the cases that I pay attention to and that you would care about or see in the news are the big public policy issues where there's, there's a, 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 either a public interest advocacy, advocacy group that is try, trying to get a change in the law or a change in government policy, and they're using two courts. They're using the courts of law and justice, and they're using courts of public opinion. And the court of justice is a place, a forum, to add another dimension to the, dis the dispute or the desire to change public policy. So it's very important for lawyers, for the attorney general, to understand uh, that they are pleading, in a sense, before both courts. That doesn't politicize their role, but it means that they have to be very sensitive about what they're saying and who they're saying it to. Um, because if it lands wrong, they can be damaging relationships uh, in the Crown Indigenous context, relationships with Indigenous peoples that the government has a broader agenda to try to repair and, and replace with something better. And they could be damaging relationships or respect for public institutions that could survive in terms of the lack of respect uh, one government or one, uh, one period of time. So, so it's a, it, I would say it's a heavy burden. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't characterize it as heavier than the burden that all lawyers face when they're acting for clients. The duty of utmost good faith is there everywhere. I'll leave to others to say whether there's a higher level of duty or a different duty for Crown lawyers, but it certainly looks a bit different to me. Um, we often, with our clients in the context we're talking about today, Indigenous issues, try to find a way to tell them um, what they need to know rather than what they want to hear. And again, that if you have a good, strong, uh, trusting relationship, you can do that with them, but it's not always easy if you come from a, a point where they're trying to get to point A and you're saying, ah, really, um, that's what you think you need to get to, but it's really point B that is important here in a broader context. So I think that's it's generally true for all lawyers when you're dealing with clients, whether sophisticated or not. 
uh, you have to help them with what they need to know and what service they need from you, not necessarily just what they ask for or think they need. Um, both in the criminal law context, which is managed through an independent prosecution service, but in the civil litigation context, which I know, there is an enormous uh, power imbalance between the Crown and, and the lawyers for the Attorney General and most litigants before the court. Now, I can, I can give examples in where it doesn't appear to be that case. I mean, I was talking to Alice Woolley about a, a, a tax case in which the justice contingent is four or five lawyers. The, uh, the lawyers for the multi-billion dollar uh, group that doesn't want to pay the tax is about 35 or 36 lawyers. So it doesn't look like a power imbalance in favor of the Crown. But writ large, and generally speaking, there is an enormous power imbalance, and certainly in the Crown-Indigenous relationship. So you have to be very careful uh, when you are acting in that context and how you communicate with opposing counsel and how you communicate through them to their clients, uh, particularly, again, with the overarching desire to rebuild a relationship. Um, I think it's not uncommon for lawyers who are dealing with a lawyer on the other side of a case to get annoyed with that lawyer and want to react in a way that gets back at that lawyer, but it's extremely unproductive and, I'd say, dangerous if we forget uh, who we are dealing with in the broader context in, in the Crown Indigenous relationship. Um, we often have clients who say to us, you know, just give us our legal advice and stay out of our policy. That's our business. Um, and sometimes we try to do that. Sometimes we try to give them policy advice and sometimes we tell them they have to hear it from us. Now, I was a lawyer, I was the head of legal services for uh, Fisheries and Oceans and Coast Guard for a few years, and lawyers who are heads of LSUs, legal services units, so all the, all the federal departments and agencies have justice lawyers and teams of lawyers. Uh, the deputy minister for, for that department, and there were two of them that I worked for, they made it very clear that uh, as their lawyer, I did more than just provide them solid legal advice and risk advice and legal risk advice. I was to be a full member of their executive and to p be part of the same peer review and critical challenge function that all assistant deputy ministers in that department were. They wanted me to give as good as I got. So if I was giving them a legal advice, I'd say this is legal advice, this is what the jurisprudence says, this is your statute, these are the risks if you try to take that course of action. And now I want to give you some other advice. That's a really dumb way to go. You know, you might be able to win that case or do that thing or avoid that liability, but man oh man, what are you thinking? What are you trying to do here? So, and they accepted, respected, and encouraged that. And as did the ministers that uh, I, I worked for w with Fisheries and Oceans. So that's an important role that we can play, particularly if they have supportive deputy ministers, but not all of them that way. I know some of my colleagues who've been heads of legal services have been told flat out by their deputy minister client, just give me the legal advice and leave alone our policy. That's none of your business. But in, in the world we're in now, uh, particularly before the courts, um, and if we get to the Supreme Court of Canada, as we often do, I tell our litigators, remember, this is not just a court of law, uh, so don't be uh, trying to create the best legal, logical, persuasive argument on the law. It's a court of justice, but more importantly, it's a policy court. That's the place where the law gets changed more often than anywhere else. It's in there that in the, they are the de definitive decider of change in the law. So in the Crown Indigenous litigation that we've looked at, we are very confident with our feet planted firmly looking into the past to say where the law has come to. So when our clients say, what's the jurisprudence say on this Aboriginal issue? Is there an obligation, a liability? Uh, are we at risk here? We can say very confidently, well, uh, if I were just looking into the past as confidently as I can, uh, no, you're not at risk. But if I turn around and look into the future, and if I think of what the courts have been doing over the last number of decades, I'm not so confident at all. So you should think long and hard about whether you want to take this, court, this issue to courts, this matter of broad public policy, this matter of nation building that it often is. Do you really want the courts to decide these things? You can if you think that's the best approach, but man oh man, you've got to think long and hard about whether that's what you want. And the courts have often said to us, to the Crown, and to uh, uh, Council for Indigenous Organizations, many of these things are best resolved through negotiation, conciliation, talking it through, not through courts. So the courts will sometimes whack each of us if they think we're being too obstreperous or too stubborn in our, in our views. And so it's something that we tell clients all the time. 
Uh, our risk advice is, is good in settled areas of the law. It's not so good in areas uh, that are, are dynamic and constantly changing. Um, the other thing is that, that Section 35 of the Constitution, 1982, completely threw us into a different realm. Often lawyers that I've uh, tried to uh, work with over the years or guide or give direction to, when I start talking about some of these public policy issues that are at play here, they say, well, that's politics. I want to deal with the law. Well, you can't. Uh, you can't make that easy, dismissive uh, suggestion that these are politics or political issues. They're not. Supreme Court of Canada, in, in what did it do with Section 35? It invented a concept. It said, what's Section 35 about? It's not some legalistic approach to rights, pass, fail, empty box, full box, partially full box. It said, no, no the, the, the fundamental purpose of Section 35 is to build a nation, to, to, to reconcile the competing or sometimes competing aspirations, desires, dreams of Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples. That's a pretty hard one to put into legal boxes of pass, fail, binary, yes, no. And so that means we have to be uh, good scholars of, of public policy, good scholars of nation building, quite apart from law and textbooks and, per, and jurisprudence. Uh, that makes our jobs a lot harder, but it also makes them a lot richer. And it also gives us, I think, some room to say to our clients, you're going to have to listen to us in terms of our policy advice or our legal policy advice or whether we think that's the right thing to do. Because if you don't, the Supreme Court may listen and they'll say, you know what, you may be right on the law in the past and the jurisprudence from before, but we're building something new. And every time we say that something can't be reconciled, the court generally says, yeah, you're wrong. So a couple of examples, and Richard, tell me how much time I've got here. Five, okay. Uh, just want to make sure I don't miss anything that's, that I think is important to tell you. So every so often when we will go to the, the court, we'll say, okay, so the courts have found that there's a duty to consult. Well, that can't mean in relation to existing treaties, number of treaties or others, because you know surely those were seed and surrender and extinguish and end and be done with it, treaties, and so that's no more a requirement for consultation on the part of the Crown. The court said, wrong. In the Miccosuc Creek case, they said essentially, no, this isn't a divorce, this is a marriage, this is forever. And the rules of engagement will be adjusted in terms of a duty to consult to accommodate the notion of treaties and that we're all treaty peoples. Same thing with respect to uh, the rights of Métis. We said, well, the tests for Aboriginal rights are clear, yet it's based on a, on a foundation of pre-contact, of sovereignty, and, and uh, all those things. You can't possibly have uh, a test like that that would work for Métis, so uh, they probably have no rights. Wrong. They said, let's adjust the test. Métis are a, a people that are, are a confluence of the, the pre-contact peoples and the settler peoples. And if you need to adjust the test to come up with a test for Aboriginal rights for Métis, we'll do it. So every time we run up against what we think is an impossibility, uh, and I'll just throw out some that are before the courts now, can Aboriginal people have a uh, title to submerged lands? Well, I guess it, one answer would be, no, it's impossible because uh, the submerged lands and navigable waters, uh, you have a conflict between the exclusive rights of Aboriginal title on the one hand and the exclusive access rights of, for navigable waters and fishing and the rest of it, so they can't possibly be reconciled. I kind of think that if we got to the Supreme Court of, say, Court, Court of Canada, they might not agree. They may say, no, they might be, there might be some way to reconcile those things. Or what about Aboriginal title and fee simple title? You know, there's a claim to a vast territory and say they're successful in court, but there are a whole bunch of fee simple property owners on that land. Does that mean that these exclusivities, the exclusive right to possession of fee simple and the exclusive right to possession of Aboriginal title are, are impossible to reconcile? Don't know. Um, it better that we work it out outside the courts or we could wait for the court to tell us yet again how reconciliation works. So I think it's, it's something where we have to work out uh, new organizing principles for how we get along together as opposed to saying these are irre irreconcilable so somebody has to win. There has to be a winner and a loser and we want it to be this. Um, so with, with Section 35 and its fundamental nation-building core, with other outcroppings of that, such as the honor of the crown and how it's engaged in all of the dealings with uh, indigenous peoples, with the, with the notion of fiduciaries, that not every, uh, every situation involves a specific duty, but the crown-indigenous relationship is always one based on fiduciaries. That has to tell us something about how we engage with indigenous peoples, indigenous nations, whether we think there's a specific duty in the case or not. So um, 
I would say that um, we have to think about not only our own biases and stereotypes and biases or, or, or past uh, uh, knowledge built up over time about what the law allows for or doesn't allow for, we also have to make room for the kind of nation building obligations that come out of Section 35. So if nothing else, it, it tells me that uh, government lawyers who are engaged in these issues have to have strong dialogues with their clients about how you get through this, how you, how you don't get too certain about what the legal risk is or who's going to be the winner or loser or who should be the winner or loser in a particular conflict. Um, so I mean, I'd just say in, 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 in ending it, um, there are, there are a number of ways that we can go about this, and I think the way uh, our minister would like to go about some of it is to start with the principles that she and the, the Prime Minister issued last July, the 10 principles on a kind of a re-engagement with Indigenous peoples and how the Crown should deal with them. She wants to deal with that in a litigation context as well, because it's often, be said, often been said to us in the last 18 months, you know, the government seems to be promising something new, but the litigation on the part of the defenses on the part of the Crown sure look an awful lot like the traditional ones. Are you going to do nothing new and different? We've made some headway and progress, but we're not done by any long stretch. And I think, uh, stay tuned, but I think our minister will give us some clearer direction about uh, conducting litigation in this Crown Indigenous relationship. And some of our clients in the, in the sense of quote unquote brackets, uh, departments or agencies or branches might not like it. But we hope that the Crown, in a broader sense, will. So that's all I wanted to say, so thank you. I'm very happy to be here and I introduce myself in Mi'kmaq and I uh, am a proud a member of the Mi'kmaq Nation and uh, uh, most of you are students who are here but for our guests who are traveling I welcome you to Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, I'm originally from Geskebewagi which in Mi'kmaq means the last land but we are currently in Eskigawagik which uh, used to be called Chibuktuk, which meant Great Harbor, but it was changed by the Mi'kmaq around the time of the fur trade to mean Eskigawagik, which means skin dresser place. It's just a little history about where we are. So, um, <clears throat> this is sort of a two-parter. Uh, Jeff and I have sort of divided this, so if there's stuff that I've missed, Jeff's gonna cover it. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a, a topic that has preoccupied me since I was a law student. So in third year, when I took Aboriginal Peoples, and some of you are taking it or have taken it from me, uh, the paper that I wrote about uh, was about Crown litigation conduct um, and whether there was uh, a duty on the Crown to, um, based on the honour of the Crown, to litigate in good faith or whether there was any certain particular conduct that was imposed because of that concept. And I wrote that because I, in second year, I clerked at a firm, Virgil's, and uh, got to tag along to some provincial court Aboriginal rights cases. And there was some, certainly some conduct that raised my eyebrows. And um, yeah, so it is something that uh, yeah, interests me quite a bit. And I see the kind of conduct um, that we're talking about here as sort of broadly falling into two categories. So one, I would say uh, procedural tactics. So um, relying on procedural rules, judicial review rules, um, to attempt to avoid hearing cases on their merits, right? Um, and, and you know, we're, you're all learning uh, civil procedure, and this is something that um, you know we, we study, and certainly in, in practicing law and firms, it, it you know we we certainly go to those types of procedural tactics. I would say there's also substantive tactics. So these would be arguments with respect to Aboriginal peoples that are either based on misstatements of the law, stereotypical portrayals of Aboriginal people, or otherwise um, arguments that could be considered offensive 
to either the dignity, the culture, or the history, or the right to self-determination of indigenous people. So, yeah, so I looked at this paper, and this was right after uh, Haida had come out, um, and tried to see if there was an argument based on uh, honor of the crown as the court had defined it in Haida. Um, anyway, so it was a fine paper, um, <laughs> I thought, uh, but it was, it was actually, the, the question was answered in a case the following year um, at the Federal Court of Appeal by Justice Rothstein, as he then was, um, in a case called Stony Band. So there, a lower court judge had questioned the honorableness of Crown conduct um, because the Crown had made an argument sort of unfairly relying on delay when it hadn't done anything to sort of move the case along. In fact, it hadn't filed a defense and it kind of gave the Aboriginal claimant the, the perception that you know they didn't have an issue with time. But then uh, when uh, the, the claimant then tried to move the claim along, they brought a claim based on procedural fairness and delay and prejudice and, and these sorts of things. So the argument was uh, made and, and Judge Rothstein um, uh, said that there was no such duty embedded within the concept of honor of the crown or fiduciary duty and that in fact he had considerable difficulty with such a concept. Um, yeah, he didn't think that they supported any form of higher conduct and his main rationale was that well the Supreme Court of Canada recognizes the imposition of lashes and limitation defenses in Aboriginal rights cases so procedural arguments are just fair game. And he put a lot of faith into the adversarial system and that that will, you know, the fact that people can approach the adversarial system um, what would be the, the, the cure to any sort of defect in the system. Um, and essentially finding that uh, to impose such a duty on the Crown would, it, would compromise the Crown in advancing or defending its position. So, so Crown conduct, so that, so that argument's been gone for a little bit. But since, um, since I've started litigating and, and now as a, a law professor, it's an issue that really still continues um, to concern me. Um, in my own cases, for the 10 years uh, that I uh, was primarily practicing, I saw a number of arguments. And I, I practiced in the heyday of the Harper uh, regime. And uh, it certainly was a busy time for my firm. Um, in terms of, it, we, we did have a number of cases um, against the federal government. And uh, some of the arguments that I saw, you know, there was arguments, one I recall, uh, it was an important claim and the government advanced a procedural argument about mootness, that the claim was no longer, um, didn't have to be heard. We were bringing a judicial review to an important decision regarding social assistance on reserve. And the, um, uh, the Crown argued that because one of the bands involved has signed a funding agreement, and these are funding agreements that um, are standard form agreements that the bands have no choice over and they need this funding in order to provide essential services. There had been some fine print that had been added to the most recent version of the funding agreement, and it was argued that the fine print in the most recent version, in fact, precluded the band from making an argument. But they hadn't actually really consented to or even had that drawn to their attention. So that argument wasn't accepted, but to me, uh, is not is a sort of argument that again tries to get the claim out before actually hearing on its merits. Um, I've also had situations where there was so same case later on where a key document was not disclosed until after the the, the case was heard, um, and there has been more recent examples as well of some cases where there's been issues around disclosure of documents. Um, in one case that I had which was about um, implementation of the 1999 Supreme Court of Canada Marshall decision. Um, it was about the Crown's failure to fully implement it. And in arguing the case, and this kind of goes, again, an example of a substantive sort of concerning argument, the, the, the Crown arguing the case suggested that Marshall was just about the man, Donald Marshall Jr., and did not have any larger impact beyond the man. Uh, and, and didn't have a larger impact to Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia, which, uh, for the Mi'kmaq people who were in the audience, found that to be a bit offensive. Um, and there's more, uh, and, and it's not just relating to the federal crown. Um, there was last year's infamous case where it was argued uh, by the government of Nova Scotia that it, it owed no duty to consult with the Mi'kmaq of Sibag and Egeti, uh, because they were a quote, conquered people. I had another case in New Brunswick last year where it was argued um, that the Mi'kmaq were not a nation because they had a decentralized form of government and lacked a super chief. And, and I just got the decision today and the super chief won. So I'm not very happy. 
uh, a meeting that the government did accept that Mi'kmaq were not a nation in that sense because they lacked a centralized form of government that resembled something more of a Euro-Canadian variety. Anyway, I'm still uh, processing that one. Um, and I'm not here just to tell a bunch of war stories. Uh, I do want to talk about the development of the Trudeau government's new approach uh, um, to litigation, what they've actually called uh, respectful litigation with Aboriginal people, and Jeff spoke about it a little bit. And I'm here to say I think it is a positive development. Um, and so I pulled uh, some of these figures off um, some government websites last night, but it shows that funding by the Department of Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, uh, it's legal cost oh, from 2007 to last year, 2016. And so we do see that there has been, um, you know, sort of this is, I would say, the sort of Harper heyday that I was referring to. Um, where their work was quite a bit of litigation ongoing. We can see in the, Latin, the more recent years that that is, uh, has been decreasing. So it, it, is, it is clear that the government is litigating less, and I would say that's a positive development. But I will add a few more points as well. Um, so I remember, because I quoted this in a paper, in 2013-2014, so it'd be this date, um, the amount that INAC had spent in litigation costs in fact doubled, uh, dwarfed uh, by, by, twi by twice the amount, um, the next runner-up in terms of government departments uh, who spend a lot on litigation, which is CRA, the Canada Revenue Ag Agency, whose mandate is to sue people who do not pay their taxes. <laughs> so, um, and, and I have, and also the thing to point out is INAC is uh, the largest spender on legal costs of all government departments at the, uh, with uh, the government of Canada. So that is certainly something to keep in mind. So we've got the litigation of this year, uh, the amount for last year, sorry, at 66 million. So it is down, and, and that is, um, I think, reason to celebrate. Um, however, there are continuing issues. I mean, part of it is perhaps maybe a bit of proportionality. Some of you might remember the case that came out, or the news release a couple weeks ago about a case where a young lady is fighting for. Um, it's bringing a judicial review in terms of access to services, braces, a young First Nations lady. And uh, it, the braces that she's seeking to have covered by the non-insured health benefits at Health Canada cost $6,000. And it came out in the news that Canada has spent $110,000 litigating that case. So there's a question of proportionality. I think there's also been some other issues. I, I, I do, like I say, applaud uh, the, uh, the approach, but there are some issues. So one of the things that Canada mentions on its website about the, this approach that it's now taking is that it has decided not to um, appeal or uh, continue judicially reviewing certain cases, which I think is a positive development. However, um, what we've also seen it is in a few instances, um, that may be perhaps, uh, there, there are issues around whether Canada is actually, even though it's not appealing the decision, actually complying with the decision. So my first example of this is the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society case, um, which uh, was about the underfunding of child welfare services in First Nations communities. So this case was primarily argued uh, under the Harper administration, um, and uh, ultimately uh, the government was unsuccessful and was found to be discriminate, discriminating and knowingly underfunding child welfare services. And you know, a quote that I will pull from it is that over, the tribunal said that overall it found that INACS, or Indigenous Affairs position, to be unreasonable, unconvincing, and not supported by the preponderance of evidence in this case. And that case was nine years in the make, it was nine years at the tribunal. Um, there was various attempts to strike it out on procedural grounds before it actually got to the hearing on the merits. Um, and the government spent $5.3 million in legal fees up to the, that decision in 2016. So Canada did not appeal, and, and I think a lot of people were quite pleased with that, um, and the expectation was that Canada would then go on um, to uh, um, address the, the order or the ruling, and to explain that a little bit, it's a, it's a very complex case, and the tribunal maintains supervisory jurisdiction to uh, address long-term issues with the parties. However, it did order some immediate remedies, which were one, that Canada ceases discriminatory practices and, and stop underfunding these services, and also it ordered that Canada must cease applying a, ver a narrow interpretation of Jordan's principle um, and implement a full meaning of, of Jordan's principle. 
So since January 2016, so we're now almost to a two-year anniversary of the decision, um, there have been numerous uh, times that, that the parties have had gone to go back to the tribunal. Um, the parties, uh, the AFN, Cindy Blackstock, and various intervening parties uh, have been back uh, three times uh, on non-compliance, seek seeking an order that the government is not complying uh, with what the tribunal had ordered. Um, and so there is this dispute, and, um, and it continues to be an issue. And so we have this. This is from the very last uh, order, which was April 2017. Um, the tribunal says it's now been over a year since the decision, and these proceedings have yet to advance past the provision of immediate relief. The complainants, the commission, and the interested parties want to see meaningful change for First Nations children and families, and want to ensure Canada is implementing that change at the first reasonable occasion. The panel shares their desire for meaningful and expeditious change. And so yet, you know, there's still this debate happening and continuing. And uh, clearly the panel itself is expressing frustration here, uh, as much as the parties, about the slowness of implementation of that decision. Another case where the government decided not to appeal uh, is a decision called Deschanel, which was another challenge to the ongoing gender discrimination in the Indian status provisions. In the Indian Act, it was another Section 15 case. Um, there had been previous decisions in the past. And Canada's approach to dealing with these cases, there was a previous case called McIver, is, uh, was in the case of McIver and some previous cases, to, to go and fix the particular type of discrimination that was found in the case, um, in the particular case, but then not necessarily address continuing and other forms of discrimination, including uh, further gender discrimination in the provisions. Mm. So in this case, <clears throat> um, the tribunal actually commented on that and suggested that, um, in fact, uh, in saying in this quote in very overt terms, that and it's encouraging Canada not just to do the bare minimum in addressing its decisions, um, but uh, to actually address the full extent of gender discrimination. And um, yes, so since Canada has decided not to appeal this, there has been this continuing issue where there was draft legislation that was proposed by Canada. Uh, the Senate um, and other uh, interveners and on behalf of Indigenous groups um, complained that again, it was just again doing the bare minimum and not fixing the broader discrimination. And at this point, there seems to be a little bit of an impasse between the House of Commons and Senate on this, and we'll see where that goes. A few more examples <coughs> I'd like to give. Um, so, uh, in a recent case uh, about the 1850 Robinson-Huron Treaty, I mean, this case is still before the courts, um, but it's a case about uh, a historic treaty and Canada's failure to pay, and uh, Ontario's failure to pay annuities under it. And it's been raised by the complainants, or the, um, the plaintiffs in that case, that um, Canada uh, it has been acting in a way that is inconsistent with the values that the current government is espousing to. Um, so for example, Canada is leading evidence in this case uh, by a, a, an expert called Professor Von Gurnett. Um, there are arguments being made about Indigenous perspectives and Aboriginal law. And Dr. Von Gurnett was quoted by the complainants in a public statement. Uh, this is from his evidence. Um, Dr. Stark's description of Anishinaabe law, jurisprudence, legal principles, and philosophies is very interesting. But it is in large, man, uh, large part a construction of late 20th century and early 21st century academics who have generated a burgeoning literature that is as sophisticated in its discourse as it is disconnected from everyday practical realities. Even if it is partly derived from the wisdom of elders and their oral traditions, uncritically projecting such a modern academic construct back in time for the purpose of illuminating what motivated the actions of past peoples or reconstructions, uh, what they would or might have thought or expected is problematic, for it must carry an assumption of continuity that needs to be balanced against the evidence for change. And so the Crown is putting forth this expert that is, you know, uh, very much, it, fairly clearly being dismissive of indigenous laws and indigenous perspectives um, that are being made today about uh, events that happened in the past. Similar arguments being made in the case um, challenging um, the Treaty of Niagara of 1764, calling it a so-called treaty. Um, and also there are arguments being made in that case or e expert evidence that's being put forward that the Royal Proclamation of 1763 has no legal effect. 
So this, I think, is probably one of the more problematic examples um, that I can point to um, in that, you know, the, the TRC report talks about the importance and the fun fundamental nature of the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and the Treaty of Niagara and the importance of recognizing Indigenous law. And yet we see these cases where the arguments that are being put forward are challenging directly against that. So. Have I got a couple minutes to go? Two minutes. Two minutes. So I'm going to skip my further examples, but there are further examples. Um, and um, to actually go to what, what kind of things can be done. Um, I do think that, as I say, this new approach is good, but it's not enough. Because um, there's lots of arguments that are still being made. And I think that UNDRIP provides um, some suggestions that we haven't really talked about. I haven't heard anybody talk about these. We were talking about 27 and 28. Let me talk about a few more that I think um, we need to ask the government, what are they doing on it? So TRC called to Action 26 actually calls on governments to, to actually stop relying on limitations defenses to defend their legal actions of any historic historical abuse brought by Aboriginal people. And um, I've read the TRC report. I don't think they're just talking about claims of residential school abuses. I think it goes further than that. They also um, um, call on the government to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous people and lands, including the doctrines of discovery and terra nullius and to reform their litigation strategies based on that. And so we haven't heard that. And I think that um, the, the, the example that I gave previously about uh, the treaty annuities case, those arguments essentially being extremely dismissive of indigenous laws and um, it are very much uh, in keeping with arguments that are uh, close to the doctrine of discovery. So uh, that could be something that could be changed. Um, the TRC report also calls on the government to repudiate, con oh yeah, so we covered that one, got that limitations, <coughs> litigation strategy, also calls on the government of Canada to develop a policy of transparency by publishing its legal opinions on Aboriginal and treaty rights cases. I think this would be a really significant and helpful um, thing to help improve the relationship and perhaps develop more honesty and candor. Um, Finally, also, the Government of Canada has uh, embraced the UN Declaration, and the UN Declaration, among many other principles, talks about the right to access to and prompt decision-making through a just and fair procedures for the resolution of conflicts and disputes with the state. So I think that these are all principles that can enhance um, the uh, approach that the current government has committed to and should be seriously discussed. Otherwise, I have fears that um, this is a lot of words and simply a thin veneer to a very colonial process that continues. So, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Do you want to know? Yeah, okay, he wants all my stuff. <laughs> things to start. First is a thank you to the organizers for bringing all of us together and my panelists here for sharing what they have. And the second is a land acknowledgement. As a Cree man, I'm grateful to be in Mi'kmaq territory because as I travel with my family and as I travel on my own and I'm outside of Cree territory, there are protocols where we are required to not only enter in, to, but to also acknowledge. And why do we do land acknowledgement? There's a number of reasons institutions do them, and there are different reasons why we do them as individuals. Where well, we are acknowledging not only the land that we are on, but our relationship to it. As the dean, and I want to thank you for your acknowledgement at the beginning, it was a statement of fact of where we are, whose land we are on. I would add to that, as a guest and visitor, how grateful I am to the Mi'kmaq that remind us what it means to share. Share lands, but also share resources and ideas. So thank you for that greeting earlier. I am reformulating my thoughts now uh, <laughs> because of what both of um, 
my colleagues here have had to say. But I want to talk a little bit about ethics macro. We've seen some examples that Professor Metallic, and I hope you know how lucky you are to have her here, <laughs> that she has shared some of those specific examples in law of what we are seeing, some of what Jeff has talked about from the relationship perspective. I'm going to ask us to go just a little bit to a different location, maybe a few feet up, as we think about our relationships and what we are doing. Some of you in this room are beginning your journey in law. You will all have had an idea of what law is, or you wouldn't have applied to law school wanting to pursue this, because we don't make the application process easy for you. I wonder how many of you have had your ideas of what law is change since you have arrived. So I'm going to ask you to think about that inside as I talk to you about other ideas of law. Often when I'm teaching first year constitutional, one of the first questions that comes up, because in my classroom we spend about five weeks, the first five weeks, listening to stories. I bring in a drum. I bring in wampum belts. And we talk about those as sources of law. Inevitably the question comes, but why didn't you write things down? I ask that question to be held until we come to, or maybe some of you are right now, division of powers. And I say that because by the time we start diving into Canadian jurisprudence, inevitably, the first class, week six, that we do this, I don't understand what the court has done here. My response to that is straightforward. Why not? It was written down. <laughs> <laughs> And when we write law down, particularly in English, we have decided that this is law. This is the form that law must take, because it is a superior form of law. But if that were true, then why do we need to generate an entire justice system where every single actor involved is required to do what? interpret exactly those words that we just wrote down because none of us agree on that mm -hmm. meaning. <laughs> Writing law down means law has been written down. Writing law down in English means we wrote law down in English. Full stop. It doesn't mean it is a better form. It means it is a form and it is a source of law. You were looking on the screen at Norval Morisot's sixth panel of six of a man transforming into Copper Thunderbird, which was his spirit name. Norval Morisot is one of this country's greatest artists. The original hangs in a series of six along a wall at the Art Gallery of Ontario. The first begins with a portrait of the artist himself, and each panel sees him transform into Thunderbird that you see here. I have chosen Thunderbird for a reason today, Dan Amiki. Yesterday, when I was flying in, I was above Halifax a lot longer than it actually took to get down into Halifax. <laughs> because there was rain and there was wind and the pilot was very congenial in saying, sorry about the weather folks, we just have to circle around again. And it struck me in the moment where I could have been inconvenienced about what Anamiki does for us and that this is their time. And that that thunder and that wind is here for a reason now. In the spring, they arrive. They bring with them the thunder and the flashes of lightning from their eyes. But in this season, as we move into that freezing moon that is beginning to rise now, they're leaving. They're gathering the clouds to them. And they are lifting themselves back up into the sky where they'll rest for the winter before they join us again next spring. We need to think about the ways that we relate to the world and the law around us and the places that we might find it. It isn't always in what is written. When we seek to reduce relationships to writing, to protocols, to rules that we wrote down, the moment we do this, we are capturing something that needs to be interpreted, argued, disagreed about. And somehow, we have come to the conclusion that by testing that, by arguing with each other, we're going to get the best of what we needed to write down. I 
think Professor Metallic has demonstrated numbers of cases where we're not getting the best if humanity is what is best. If it is about an exertion of authority and power, we're hitting that mark. <laughs> I'm now going to begin with my slides. <laughs> myself at the end, I did. So this would not be the first time I have done this. <laughs> this graphic comes to us from Christy Belcourt, who is a Métis artist. When she was producing this, she was sitting at Standing Rock about pipelines, right? Remember that? Just because it's not in the news today doesn't mean that there's not still trouble happening. What we are seeing here is another version of Thunderbird and the connection of women to that water, to the source of life, right? For Cree people, we talk about in our laws the role of women who are born with all the knowledge they need. They are born this way for two reasons. One, they can make water. <coughs> two, they birth spirit. Men are born with about half of what we need. And it is our job to demonstrate humility in a way that requires us to learn and listen from those women who teach us. Here we see the relationship to life and water, but I also want to come back to what you might see there and how Christy Belcourt has portrayed these intricate relationships with women, water, and Thunderbird. I'm going somewhere with this. For the scientists in the room, please don't come at me. I am going to talk about scientific theory for a minute, even though I am not one, but I like to liberate your ideas every once in a while. This is parallax theory. And essentially what it means is this. If we are all at an intersection, just over here, this half of the room is going to be on the northeast corner, this half of the room on the southwest corner, we're all going to see a red car and a blue car collide in the middle. When we go to court, this half of the room is going to say the blue car hit the red car. This half will say the red car hit the blue car. Did I get that right? You're going to say the opposite of each other. You're going to say that, and you're going to all be true. You will all be speaking the truth as you see it, as you observe it. Because parallax theory holds the idea that your position matters to understand the world around you. In Cree law, when we talk about truth, that non-objective that we pretend is objective idea, we talk about how truth is only as far as our words can cast, only as far as I know. When Cree elders appear on stands and they are told, tell the whole truth, they will all inevitably say, I can't do that. I can tell you what I know. I can tell you what I saw but I don't know what the whole truth is. And so from the beginning, it is our structure that begins to create trouble for us. Our relationships are not just political, they are. By ours, I mean the Crown and Indigenous people. They are not just legal, they are. But law has a very active role in having shaped and maintained that relationship. We can talk about nice things, we can talk in good words, but until we're prepared to talk about the hard stuff, witness what happened at this university early this week when the word white racism comes up and we all freak out about it. We need to learn in law to be brave and talk about the things others don't want to talk about, and there's lots of ways that we need to do that. First off, we need to realize that it's actually worse to be a racist than to be called one. <laughs> but we are primarily concerned about being called one and less concerned about our actual behavior. So one of the ways maybe to counter this is that we can all just say we are all racist. Let's all take the label and now let's talk about what the behavior behind it actually means by taking the name out of the way. Next thing we need to talk about is guilt. When indigenous people are speaking, oftentimes we are diminished by saying, but you're making me feel guilty. Sorry about your luck on that one. <laughs> I don't want guilt. Here's why. Guilt is a paralysis. 
it stops discussion, it stops listening, and it prevents us from change. It does this, and we build it in, and we're okay with that, because we can wrap ourselves up and justify behavior when we're saying we're feeling guilty about something. Let that part go. If there's anything that we can accomplish together tonight, let's just stop feeling guilty about stuff. And let's instead start thinking about how we're going to change that guilt into action. Because it's only our actual words and our conduct that are going to change things. Talking about how crappy we feel because somebody called us a name isn't changing anything. And I say this because some of us in this room have had centuries of being called all kinds of names. <laughs> Savage, happened in a classroom with one of my students, half-breed, happens on the laptops that's being sent around the room while I'm standing at the front teaching. It won't prevent me from lecturing. It doesn't prevent me from coming and standing in front of you saying we need to get over our racism and the name and we need to start talking about our conduct. Until we're prepared to have those discussions and if the people in this room who are being legally trained and our lawyers can't do that, we can't expect the rest of this country to do that either. But we keep asking and expecting indigenous people to do all that heavy lifting to make us feel better and not guilty anymore. That is not on indigenous people. That is on all of us to figure out for ourselves. It depends on where you sit. This is a Bentwood box. This Bentwood box sits at the Canadian Human Rights Museum in Winnipeg. It was commissioned and crafted specifically for the Canadian, for the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The way Eventwood Box is made also teaches us something about how we need to think about relationships conceptually. The artist will choose a tree after going out and fasting in the forest. So there is contemplation involved. There is an observation. There is a recognition of agency of trees. Inevitably, one will be chosen tree will be felled and reduced into a plank, a long plank. The artist will have come to their relationship with the tree by this point and begin to understand where to carve some of the wood away. Heat is added through steam and the wood is bent and it is bent and inevitably it forms a container. It is a single plank of wood. We might think about generating a bentwood box for our country and our relationships and knowing the spots that we need to bend, but knowing that we are all one country. How do we come together to form a container that is as beautiful as this, where we might place inside what we agree to, how we will live together? Inside this one, are the stories of the people who had spoken in front of that commission. At the very beginning, it was framed today to talk about 27, the recommendation inside of the TRC's calls to action. When we are talking about this, we are talking about cultural competency, intercultural competency. Here's where we're at with that. Professor Metallic and I, some of you also in this room, we have gone to your law schools. We have sat beside you. We have observed you. We have studied your law. We have gotten really good at your law. We now teach it. <laughs> all of this time, all of this time, you have learned very little about us while we sat with you while we observed you, while we studied your ways. This is a commitment now on your part. Do what we have done. If we want to make this work, you're going to have to sit with us, listen to us, talk to us, observe us, and learn our ways. That's going to take some time. It's also not going to come in a nice climate-controlled room from September to April for three years and out we go with a certificate that tells us we can do something. It is a lifetime of obligation, 
I have spent a long time on this and I know so little. But it is a requirement. Something comes on the practice of that competency that is not resulted from just one engagement, one course, however good it's going to be with Professor Metallic, it will be just your beginnings. Right? United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is another source that tells us we need to think these things through. I know that Jeffrey had talked to you about Section 35. I have a different view. I would like to say to you, I'm over Section 35. <laughs> Sort of I am, but I'm still angry, so not really. <laughs> While the court talks about Section 35 being a reconciliation section, the way that we start to read the cases tells us that what is being reconciled is indigenous people underneath Crown Sovereignty. Not one decision, not one case does our court interrogate the assumption of crown sovereignty and title. Not one time. It is, however, assumed over and over and over again to the point where we don't need to use Section 35 to examine that anymore. 1986, the Oaks case comes to us and the court is astounded that there could be the Narcotics Act that would presume guilt if you are in possession of narcotics of a certain amount, even if they were prescribed as they were for oaths. Because the court says fundamentally, there is a presumption of innocence. And this offends our way, our values, to have this assumption a reverse onus to prove innocence with assumed guilt. They reject that. We still teach and study and use the Oaks test. Four years later in Sparrow, the very first chance the Supreme Court gets to interpret what the meaning of Section 35 is. What did they do? Without any limiting language, as there is in Section 1. <coughs> Section 35, 1. Aboriginal treaty rights are hereby recognized and affirmed. Full stop. The court created a reverse onus test where the Aboriginal claimant must come forward and prove there is an existing Aboriginal right. We then move back to the Crown who gets to say, but we extinguish that, did you? <laughs> then we go to number three where it's back to the Aboriginal claimant to say, well, it wasn't extinguished, but it's being infringed, and here's the way that it's being infringed on our practices back to the crown. Who gets the last word? Well, but we meant to infringe it, and we had to because of, you know, title, sovereignty. Need we say more? And the answer is no, you don't need to say more because the court's not going to inquire into that. So we need to think through how we began to structure Section 35, what we meant by that course of jurisprudence, and how it continues to shake out. These are the reasons why I'm over that. If we want to talk about a relationship, we have to do that outside of Section 35. And that section itself needs to be reframed by the court to be the section that reconciles the Crown's assertion and this country's continued assertion of title and sovereignty. My people did not give that up. We didn't sign that away. Those treaties, they are not about surrender. In Cree law, we have a way that we are not allowed to have relationships with anybody. No engagement unless you are family. So when strangers came, we couldn't do anything until we found a way to make you family. We did that by way of treaties. So while we say, these are about you becoming family, the Crown says, this is about surrender of all the lands and resources, because that seems like a good idea. <laughs> we continue to uphold this narrative. We don't criticize and critique it enough, and we don't challenge it enough. I'm gonna move 
through a few things here. The Law Society of Upper Canada, the, sorry, the Law Society of, question. <laughs> the Advocate Society and the Indigenous Bar Association have come together to work on something that's known in early draft stages as the True North Guide. And this is really about assisting lawyers on how they're going to deal with Indigenous people. Part of what we have in there is cultural competency. It's about understanding intergenerational trauma. What could that possibly be? Here's a quick, I'll get to that in just a second in terms of an example of what that might look like. I know. Here's our bigger problem though. We have an adversarial system. We teach it. We say we thrive on that. Here's an example of how we might adopt that adversarial system by reflecting outside, looking in. Let's say Professor Metallic and I are both cardiac surgeons, not professors of law. I will go into an operating room, like a courtroom that is built especially for that purpose, operation. I will have a trained team, people of specialists with me to help ensure that operation succeeds. There will be tools specially designed just for that cardiac surgery. And if healthcare was adversarial the way law is, Dr. Metallic's role <laughs> would be to stand on the other side of the operating table and actively undo everything I am trying to do <laughs> to save the patient. <laughs> and somehow we would say that makes for the best operational outcome because it was tested. It was tested in an adversarial arena. How is it we have decided that the adversarial system is working in law? Because if you were on the indigenous side of that, the one on the operating table with your heart open, it is really tough to be part of a system that says this is going to draw the best outcome. Here's what it does come up with. It means that when you go to residential school, you had a better chance of dying than when you signed up voluntarily to go to World War II. It means that everything that has been done to Indigenous people has, in fact, been legal in this country. The law has allowed this. And as legal actors, we have allowed this. I.e., it is our responsibility. It isn't about somebody or someone else. Think about the ethics of that. It means indigenous women go away and we don't know where they are. It means this, Snow White. Take a look, her hair is pinned, her skirt is long, she's appropriately demurred and wearing just enough of a heel to make it look good without being too <laughs> difficult to walk in them all day. So she's clever. She has no clothes. Her hair is down. It is drawn in one piece. Her body is shaped in a way that is to lead us to the hypersexualization of Pocahontas. We feed this to our children over and over and over again. And we're not done. Halloween's coming up this week. How many are interested in dressing up like Pocahontas for Halloween? Apparently there's enough Canadians that this is all over stores. Where we're actively participating in the hypersexualization of indigenous women, while at the same time we're talking about how terrible this is that indigenous women keep getting murdered and going missing in this country. Happy Halloween. <laughs> when we place them together, we can see how we're supposed to treat Snow White. Because when she goes missing, we don't leave the front page of the newspaper until somebody is held accountable. We read stories about her and her family, about how much she is missed. When we have Pocahontas go missing, it's her mugshot. She was a sex worker, an addict. There are no interviews with family. She has some. They're missing her too. They have memories of her. But we consume this every single day. What are we doing about Snow White and Pocahontas? In the end, they are both women. In the end, we need to think about how we conceive law as a construction that has so deeply damaged the relationship between Crown Canadians and Indigenous people 
that we're okay with Pocahontas going away. We're okay with hypersexualizing her and feeding that to our children and then wondering why when young men grow up they can be violent toward indigenous women because we've already taught them. They are bodies for gratification. Our adversarial system is the problem. If we think about indigenous sources of law and we begin to expand our ideas of what we mean by ethics, we start to see connection. Connection to women as power. Women who make water, who are responsible for the spirits that live in the water of which we are all made from. We might think about what we would place in our box because right now, not so great. We've got work to do. We have to get over ourselves to do that. Our system depends on where you stand, on what you get to see, that how we are going to draw those outcomes. But in the end, if we do well, those Thunderbirds will come again to us next spring. They will bring that boom of thunder and those strikes of lightning and the rain that we need to survive. They will leave us again next fall, make it difficult for my flight to land. <laughs> <laughs> but when we are thinking about the profession, we need to think macro. What is the responsibility of our profession? Our ethics usually start about, well, what will defense and crown counsel do and how should we expect them to conduct themselves? And those discussions are also important. But when we are talking about ethics of the relationship with indigenous people, we need to think about the relationships and the ethics of indigenous people and our sources of law, and they are not the same thing, because we do not have an adversarial system. With that, I say hi, hi. Thank you for listening, and thank you for having me here. thank each of the presenters for the very rich presentations. Uh, my task is also to summarize and perhaps draw some threads, and I'm not sure how I could take these very rich and powerful presentations and try and say something about it in five minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I should perhaps not uh, attempt to do that other than, other than say thank you. Um, I do have, uh, but I do have lots of questions, so perhaps I could, I could pose uh, some of those, uh, and these are not just for the presenters, but for all of us to think about. Um, because uh, when Richard first asked me to be on this panel, my first reaction was, I'll be a complete outsider because I have no experience in practicing either Aboriginal or Indigenous law. Uh, but as, as, as a professor tasked with educating, with training uh, lawyers for the future, uh, it's something I think about uh, quite a lot, especially in terms of sort of ways of responding and taking seriously the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission's report and its calls to action. Um, and, so, and what has helped me think about some of these things is in fact sort of, uh, or the people are, many of my colleagues at UVic Law where, uh, where uh, several conversations are ongoing on this, just as here at, uh, at the Schulich Law School. Um, in particular, the work that's being done by the Indigenous uh, Law Research Unit uh, at UVic, uh, Professor Val Napoleon, uh, Professor John Burroughs, and I should also mention uh, Professor Rebecca Johnson who, and her work on sort of TRC and law school pedagogy. And I've, I've had an opportunity to learn from them. And so some of my comments uh, sort of come emerge from what I've understood all of this work to be. So I think one of the, one of the things that's really clear from uh, each of our presenters, uh, sort of uh, what they've shared with us is that uh, there's certainly an emerging consensus that business as usual is, is not acceptable mm. anymore, uh, whether it's on the part of the government uh, or, uh, or practitioners. Um, and and each, of, each of the speakers, each of you has indicated in your own, I think, unique and powerful ways um, that we need to rethink 
uh, and we need to think carefully about specific ways of uh, specific ways to disrupt the status quo, right? So it can't be business uh, as usual, but that needs sort of specific attention to specific tasks that are uh, before us as practitioners, as students, uh, as teachers. And so one of the things that, uh, I mean, I have to say I was, I was very heartened to see the framing of this, the title of this panel, Ethics and Profession is the Practice of Aboriginal and Indigenous Law, and I'm reading indigenous law here to mean indigenous people's law, something that emerged uh, quite clearly from Jeff's talk. Um, and so, it, because I think that is a radical move uh, in its own sense, uh, given that there are still, so last year at a conference in the United States, I was presenting some of my research and one of the questions from the audience was, well, how do we know what indigenous law is, right? So that was my opportunity to talk about, again, uh, the, the, all the work that's being done by indigenous scholars uh, here and elsewhere. But so I think framing that right away kind of signals to us that uh, there's more to what we need to engage with than simply sort of Aboriginal, what's referred to as Aboriginal law or Aboriginal crown relationships. That, and so in that spirit, what I, what I would like to hear from you is sort of how, how do you think that sort of uh, Indigenous laws and Indigenous epistemologies can help us rethink professional codes, for example, in terms of sort of uh, you know, what is a lawyer's responsibility? Um, uh, one of the guest speakers, an indigenous lawyer that I've invited to my class, ethics class to speak uh, a couple of times now, one of the things he raised was sort of, you know, one of the things you want to think about when you're thinking about representing indigenous clients is sort of who is my client? Right? Is it the band council? Is it, is it the community as a whole? Who do I owe my responsibilities to, right? So those kinds of questions which uh, the code certainly don't uh, offer uh, clear guidance on or help us think about those things in ways that I think uh, uh, what we're talking about today requires us to do. So how do we, how do we uh, you know, what, uh, in what ways can we rethink the codes and, and responsibilities uh, included in there if we take indigenous laws seriously, right? Um, another thing that, uh, that I wanna think about, us to think about if we take reconciliation seriously is sort of, and this is something uh, um, Professor John Burroughs in his work, uh, both in his work in the past and in his, uh, one of his forthcoming work talks about sort of indigenous legal uh, uh, practitioners, people who have been practicing indigenous laws, whether it's Cree law, Anishinaabe law, or Mi'kmaq law, uh, for centuries, right? And so if we are going to take indigenous laws seriously and, and the practices of those practitioners seriously, uh, to what extent do you see those as a resource for uh, enriching legal education for everyone, right? Do we have the resources and tools for, uh, for example, for example uh, resolving conflicts that may arise between rules of professional conduct uh, promulgated by law societies on one hand and, uh, and what a particular indigenous legal tradition might ask or expect of a legal practitioner, right? Do we have the, do we have the necessary resources and tools to think about those kinds of issues um, is something I think we need to uh, gives more thought to. Uh, another thing to think about, uh, I and I'm putting all these questions out there because I don't have the answers. <laughs> um, in, in what ways do uh, or can indigenous laws in fact strengthen the practice of non-indigenous law, right? So common law and civil law, in what ways can we, what can be drawn in order to strengthen ways of being better practitioners of common law and civil law? Um, and I wonder if my five minutes are over, but I'll, I'll just take maybe uh, another minute to uh, pick up on something that uh, Jeff, you mentioned about intercultural competency. Yes, there's clearly the, uh, the calls to action 27 and 28 ask us to uh, train lawyers in ways that make them more culturally competent, but, and this is a sneak peek to sort of what I'm presenting on tomorrow, is that I'm a little bit troubled by the focus 
or the rush to embrace intercultural competency without having a clear sense of what that means, uh, particularly when, uh, when culture or uh, culture becomes a, a way of not, be, saying the word culture becomes uh, a way out of saying other words, for example, racism or colonial. It's easier to talk about intercultural competency, uh, but as Jeff also rightly mentioned, it's really hard to talk about racism. It's really hard to t talk about colonialism. Uh, those are words that make us more uncomfortable. So I'm wondering if this sort of embrace of intercultural competency says something about the things that we're also uncomfortable uh, to talk about. Uh, so I think I'll end there and I'll invite you to respond and then are we opening it up to, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Jeff does. You go. No, no, no. You go. No, you go. I, no, I'm not. <laughs> so those were easy questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to deal with them out of order. So, uh, uh, yes, intercultural competency is the nice way. It's also like saying reconciliation is a nice way of saying we really oppress people for a long time. Let's reconcile, right? Let's not talk about oppression. Let's not talk about law's role in violence and committing violence. Instead, let's just leave that conversation, we all know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and let's now talk about reconciliation. In Cree, there is no word for reconciliation. So this whole framework with indigenous people gets set out without actually, I don't know, talking to the indigenous people whom we want to have the relationship with to say, what do you need? What's going on? And how do we how do we engage? As opposed to commencing the conversation, setting the framework, and then saying fit in. In the same way, we're all supposed to fit in Section Thirty Five, right? And that's interpretation. So intercultural competency has relevance, I think, in other spaces too. Though there is something about it uh, that matters. It matters particularly for lawyers uh, because lawyers have been involved in the thinking and the crafting and the enforcement of Canadian law that has been used so effectively against Indigenous people. Uh, but I, I agree with the premise that it, it helps us get rid of some of that bad stuff. Um, but we need to talk about that, right? You can't be in an abusive relationship and then go to get better, to continue that relationship without ever actually talking about the harm and without talking about the abuse, right? Like those conversations actually, that, that's what therapy is for. And maybe we just need like a national therapy session <laughs> together, um, which could be good. Uh, but it can't be like the work of TRC. That subsequently, right, important work, and it's had profound change at moving us forward. But what struck me about that is how quickly the country phrased that is, oh, indigenous people's history. No, this is Canada's history. We all own that, right? The indigenous people and the stories that we're watching on the news, earlier today there was a panel talking about uh, 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 privacy uh, and how sometimes, right, we want to talk about mental health issues in law school and in the profession, but we really don't want to talk about it because we don't want to talk about it openly. Uh, the example that I might give about that is that uh, at Windsor Faculty of Law, we have a meeting, we talk, we are finding out from professionals, there's a number of students that have mental health issues that they're struggling with, and we want to talk about this stuff because we need to talk about it. But then when we're told, but we can't tell you who, the three indigenous scholars in the room just picked up our heads and said, then why are we having this conversation? If you're going to tell us there's a problem, but we can't tell you really what the problem is other than naming it for you and there's nothing you can do about it, but we need you to fix it. <laughs> when it is indigenous people in front of microphones and cameras talking about the most intimate forms of abuse, we're prepared to have a national discussion on that. We're going to tune in and we're going to watch that. We're prepared to let indigenous people's stories spill out. But when it comes now to non-indigenous people having a discussion about important issues around mental health in the profession, 
well, now privacy matters, and we don't want to have an open discussion about that. Why are we prepared in this country to go through the tragic pornography of watching indigenous people expose their hearts, but we're not prepared to do that in the spaces that we currently occupy, law school, courtrooms. We need to have those conversations around mental health, right? And that's part of our national therapy session because those arrive for a number of complicated reasons. And part of the reasons that they sustain it's because we don't want to talk about them out loud. We just want to reduce them to data. And so I might say that that's also part of that cultural competency that we can learn and practice. It's not just with indigenous people. There's much sort of bigger issues around uh, there too. Ways that indigenous law can strengthen common law. Well, there's lots, but there's also an importance about saying in this space, how might Mi'kmaq law influence common law here? Because remember, the indigenous laws of the land that you are in were the first laws of the land that you are in, and they have been practiced a lot longer than common and civil law. And so there is definitely something to be drawn from them. But I'm not sure if there's a strengthening of common and civil as being informed when we've created this legally pluralistic society. We have space in this country to make room for indigenous legal orders, too. And then let's see how they inform each other. Uh, and then, I don't know, the first question was um, rethinking those professional codes of conduct. You know, Cree people, uh, because there's not going to be an indigenous pen, indigenous response, uh, our law is structured around kinship, relationships. When I was talking to you earlier about making everybody family, think about a code of professional conduct that doesn't start with a balancing of power and authority, but starts about relationships and the expression of relationships. Not about duty and the assumptions of who has the power and who doesn't, right? Lawyers, we often get taught, especially in an earlier discussion on another panel today, about the data where lawyers need to talk to their clients because communications are one of the biggest points of complaint that arises in front of law societies and uh, the insurance companies. There's also another part to that. Lawyers think we know everything. We're taught you know everything. Think back to your first day at law school. You're so special, <laughs> right? Look at you smart, smart people. You're so special to be here. It begins that narrative right away. And we sustain that narrative throughout so that by the time you sit down with your clients, you think you have all the power, and you think you actually know everything. And that knowing prevents us from hearing, because in law school and in the practice, we're taught to listen only to the point where we can argue and critique. Where's the weak spot? And as soon as I found it and heard it, I'm done listening to you. I'm just going <laughs> to wait until it's my turn. In Cree way, we're taught to listen to understand. That is a very different thing. And so if we think about building our professional codes of conduct, we need to think about what we want to accomplish as a profession. Is it about the continued close clutching of power and authority? Or is it about recognizing how little we actually know and how little power we should have in that relationship? But it's a reframing of the profession that the codes need to reflect, I think is what I'm trying to say. Okay, now we're done. Good night. No. <laughs> Over to these guys to give much better answers now. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to be pretty honest and a bit personal about the, I, I, I'll, First time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I find amazing the work that's happening, you know, Hadley Freeland and at your yes. institution. Um, but, um, and I think it, it is very important, and, and there's so much important work that Indigenous laws have. Um, to uh, to do in informing uh, the common law and just how we interact with each other. Um, but I always feel sort of inadequate uh, when I get asked these questions because honestly, um, I don't. I I, uh, I only speak my language a little bit. Um, I'm I was trained in a common law institution, and you know when I graduated here, there was virtually nothing about indigenous law. So I am a student as much as the students in this room are students of indigenous law. Um, and but there's 
you know, there's work to be done. The TRC uh, talks about how much uh, there has been lost. So it's almost a, sort of like a precursor. We need the space to be able, I need the space, my people need the space to be able to do this work and answer these wonderful questions about the role of Indigenous law, because it does. But, you know, we're still sort of at the, you know, at early stages of that. There is some great work happening, like with Hadley and Val. Um, but, uh, you know, I almost, it sometimes makes me feel inadequate in answering that question. But um, I think that, you know, we do need the space. And that's why I think that, you know, bringing it back to my talk, which is that, you know, we, we can't continue to have this relationship. You know, we need to address the issues of systemic underfunding in child welfare and, and virtually all other areas. And this process of continuing to fight uh, Indigenous people and First Nations at every point, on every issue, and not address it is, is, is hampering us and hindering us from actually getting to dealing with those far more fun questions that you're posing, Pooja. But we need to deal with those as well, and that's uh, something I feel very strongly about. Uh, with some temerity, I'll take a, <laughs> take a run at some of this stuff, and I, I, think I agree with everything that's been said so far, um, which is the easy part, the harder part is <laughs> what I want to say. Um, I'm cautious from my pew as a government lawyer to say too much about which, which path we should be following in what particular order. Um, I think that cultural literacy is good if it's done in the right way, so long as it's not papering over systemic racism, systemic refusal to understand an indig indigenous perspective on everything. Uh, systemic and profound refusal to accept uh, different ideas of sovereignty. So, I don't. I think we we need to pursue an awful lot of paths uh, in with a great urgency. Um, so, you know, in my little world of litigation, um, uh, we're we're trying to help a government uh, find the way, the resources, the money, the the wherewithal to reform child welfare systems and to reform the fact that kids have to be into a child welfare system at all, and to not forget the past, uh, things like the 60s scoop where, okay, first you dismantle societies by a residential school system, and then the outcropping of that is people who are so disconnected that they uh, are not parents in the normal way, and so you have to scoop them in the tens of thousands and ship them off around the world for, to completely disconnect them to their identity. So you will have heard a partial resolution to some of those historic things by at least maybe it's maybe it's tokenism maybe it's a maybe it's a I mean at least I think the, those who are initially part of this in terms of status Indians will feel at least there's some recognition of what harm was done to them in the 60s scoop and we have a long way to go with respect to those who were left out of that settlement and we have a long way to go with respect to the current and future child welfare systems of which this is part of that continuum. We need to reform our understandings of law and traditions. I guess, um, Jeff, I'm a little more optimistic about the Supreme Court. So I mean, I'm not a great believer that all these things have to go to the Supreme Court, but when people choose that court, I think we, we should be optimistic that they can come up with new approaches. So um, you're right that the notions of reconciliation have been founded in the main so far on a, well, our sovereignty trumps your sovereignty. Uh, but uh, a colleague of ours who, a uh, very senior litigator who uh, was appalled at how quickly the shelf life of Supreme Court of Canada decisions ends when we go from the uh, Sue Rodriguez case to the, uh, the Carter case, 19 years barely, and suddenly fundamental shifts on the thin premise that the, constant, that the principles for charter analysis have changed. Uh, okay, whatever. Um, so, but the, but the good news from that is that the court can rethink some principles. So I take a grain of, of hope from a decision involving uh, someone I got to know a bit uh, many years ago, Grand Chief Mike Mitchell from the Mohawks of Aquasasne. Uh, he, he said, let's test our sovereignty a bit. So let's, I'm gonna go and intentionally bring some washing machines and motor oil and other stuff across the border and see what are the boundaries of sovereignty. So you could read the case narrowly and say um, Canadian sovereignty trumps Mohawk sovereignty. I'm not so sure that's where the court would go 19 years later or later, uh, depending on who's the, the panel that hears it, because uh, Justice Binney said, well, you know, there's a merged sovereignty here. It's not a trumping of one over the other. There's a shared sovereignty that we have to figure out. 
So in that case, maybe the result, if you just look at that, was uh, a trumping of one sovereignty by another. But if another court picks up that, that task, picks up the feather and talks a little bit about it now, it may come up with a completely different idea. So uh, I, I'm more glass half full than glass half empty on that one. I'm going to say what she said. She said, so if I, if I appeal my super chief case, you won't uh, appeal or intervene. <laughs> And thank them for coming to Halifax, including Naomi, who's here today with us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>